everybody. Welcome back to NASA in Silicon Valley Live. I'm your host, Abby Tabor. And if this is your first time joining us, NASA in Silicon Valley Live is a conversational show out of NASA's Ames Research Center. And this is where we talk about all the nerdy NASA news you need to know about. So today I have with me my lovely co-host, Allison. Hi. Hi, everyone. I am your co-host, Allison. Um, if you didn't know, we are simultaneously live on Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and Periscope. But if you want to participate in the chat and ask our guests questions, there's only one place you can do that, and that's at www.twitch.tv slash NASA. Yes, and I am sure you're going to want to ask questions because today we are dealing with one of life's biggest questions. Seriously, we're going to talk about are we alone in the universe? Yeah, this is such a great topic. Yes. Um, I'm sure everyone will agree. Um, and today we have some really amazing guests with us uh, to talk about it. Yeah, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Alfonso Davila. I'm an astrobiologist here at NASA Ames, and I search for life on other planets. Excellent. And I'm Michael Furlong. I'm a roboticist here at, at Ames, and I build intelligent robots to explore other worlds. Oh, cool. So, Abby, before we get into the show, how about we remind our audience about our cool clock right here? Yes, exactly right. So this right here, this beautiful thing, is our moon countdown clock. That's because five years from now, in 2024, we are planning to send humans to the moon. That's part of our Artemis program. And this clock is counting down the days, hours, minutes, and seconds until we send the next man and the first woman to walk on the moon's south pole. So we will talk about that later in the show, but if you want to learn more, you can always go to www.nasa.gov slash Artemis. All right, so let's get right to it. Is there life beyond Earth? <laughs> well, short answer, we don't know. And that's the reason why we have to search. All right. But I will say this, the more we explore, that looks that the odds are looking better and better that they, we might find something out there. They wow. are. I'm glad yeah. to hear that. Wow. Yeah, well, exciting. Think about it. 30 years ago, what did we know about uh, other planets and the possibility of life out there? We knew there was one planet that is inhabited, us, the Earth. Mm -hmm. There was another planet, Mars, that maybe yes, maybe no. We didn't. We, we're not really sure. And that was the extent of it. Okay. Fast forward 30 years later. We know that there are moons out in the in the outer solar system around Jupiter and Saturn that have subsurface oceans of liquid water. Wow. Yeah. And we yeah. know that there are millions of planets around other stars, some of them the right distance from their sun, that liquid water could be stable on the surface. Okay. So these look like very promising places to look and yeah. to, to look and search for life. Wow. Um, more and more opportunities, places we might find something. The more we learn, the better it gets. Outstanding. Yeah, which brings the question like what is life? How do we even define it? Well, it's it's that's a complex. Well, that's a complicated one. Uh, that fundamentally, it's chemistry, right? We're made of made of chemistry, molecules interacting, reacting, uh, doing things that allow those systems to s survive. And so, when we search for life, we're essentially looking for that type that, that type of chemistry. Uh, ideally, because it's easier to find chemistry that is similar to us. But obviously, there's chances that whatever life chemistry is out there, it might be very different. Oh, wow. Okay. What's your perspective as a roboticist on this, Michael? Well, I mean, that's, uh, it's 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 a hard problem to begin with, but yeah. especially for sending robots out there, going to be doing exploration for us instead of having humans looking at all the data coming back. Um, actually, uh, trying to quantify so a computer can say yes, this is life it is a massive challenge in of itself, and I think it's fair to say we don't really have a good good way to do that just yet. No, we know, and and if the question is already difficult, imagine trying to answer the questions with robots, yeah. with surrogates, not mm -hmm. with humans mm -hmm. doing the actual experiments. Yeah. So that that's the real challenge. Like you say, you have to teach a machine to yeah, be able to do you, that. You really do, yeah, to do yeah. these things that you can sort of instinctively do, but it's hard for you to write down, yeah, this yeah, is how yeah. I did that. Yeah, 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 yeah. fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. Well, where would you go to look for life? If you were going to go out there and really place your bets on the best place to look, where well, would you if, go? If I have to pick one place, Mars is still top of my list. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And the reason is because Mars is close enough to the Earth that we can actually uh, study it repeatedly. Uh, we, we've been sending probes to Mars uh, almost continuously for the past 20 years, mm -hmm. and that's 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 given us a very good pr perspective and idea of how the planet is today and how it was in the past. Good enough that we know now that Mars, in very in many different aspects, is very similar to the Earth. It's very it's a very familiar place: mountains, volcanoes, uh, meteorite impacts, sediments, rocks that are composed of the same types of minerals that min that rocks on Earth, and so. It looks like uh, at some point the conditions for life to exist on Mars might have existed. And mm -hmm. if, if that was the case, those forms of life might have been similar to us. 
similar enough that we might recognize. Okay. Uh, similar to some kind of Earth life. Yes, not something completely alien that wouldn't, wouldn't, we wouldn't be able to recognize even if it was staring at us in the face. Okay. Uh-huh. So, so Mars is a good candidate for those reasons. Oh, wow. There, there's some comments about that already. Yeah. Gibbs, MT, take me to Mars, please. <laughs> Hobbs, 555, I hope there is human life on Mars in my lifetime. So first the robots are going to go. Yeah. Then... Fun fact, there is there is a life on Mars that we know of because obviously every every mission that goes to Mars carries a tiny bit of bio burden in it. So, okay. So uh, Earth the, microorganisms or something. Yeah, but, uh, okay. But, so technically. Technically. Yeah. All right. Well, Michael, what do you think the odds are of actually finding life on Mars? I mean, uh, honestly, like we've, we've taken samples now and so far we haven't found definitive uh, uh, proof of life. And so the odds don't look Great, but that's because it's a very big planet, and we're sort of sifting through it like grams at a time. Mm-hmm. Um, but that, so that's different, though, than asking what's the probability that there is or was life there to be found. Yeah, that's a good point, yeah. and 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 that, uh, it's important to recognize that when you look at Mars and the history of Mars, it's really a tale of two different planets. Really, Mars today is a very extreme environment. Uh, a lot of people think that uh, it, it cannot sustain life, at least not near the surface. Mm-hmm. But the more we learn about, about Mars, it tells us that way back in the past, it was a very different environment where water was flowing on the surface, uh, where there were lakes, oh. uh, maybe seas, even maybe oceans, oh, wow. not too dissimilar to lakes and seas and rivers right. on Earth. And so conditions uh, in the past might have been uh, a lot better for life. Mm. And so it is this dual uh, history of Mars, this dual, dual perspective of Mars that we need to consider when we think about life on Mars. Early life mm-hmm. uh, in, a, in a friendly environment or more recent life in a very unfriendly environment. Yeah, yeah, I see. So, yes, if it was more, if it was friendlier in the past and life did emerge, maybe we would find fossil evidence One of that One possibility somehow. is that we find fossil evidence of it. Another, pres- another possibility is that when conditions on the surface became extreme, that life retreated to other places, maybe deeper in the planet. Uh, and it's still trying to survive in those in those environments. Ooh, yeah. That's very exciting. That is exciting. Yeah. Really bad teeth asks: Is there enough sunlight reaching Mars in order for it to sustain healthy plant life, or will we have to rely on artificial growing processes? But, well, when it comes to sunlight, that, that's not a problem. That's not a limiting factor. Uh, right. There are, in fact, microorganisms on Earth that can survive hundreds of meters deep in the ocean yeah. with very tiny amounts of light, a lot less light than what reaches Mars. So. Sunlight, not an issue. Mm. We would need to worry about things like temperature and radiation and other, other and toxic elements in the ground for those plants to grow. But sunlight. So it's got enough sun. Yeah. All right. Can I ask one more question from the from the from the chat here? Twitcher asks, "What is life? Does it have to be a ner- does it have to have a nervous system or brain or both?" Well, I don't think so. Uh, some of us don't have a brain, and we can be called uh, alive. Uh, most of the history of life on Earth, there were no brains and no nervous systems. Uh-huh. It was microbial life, single-celled microorganisms. And in fact, yeah. if anything, the, the example of life on Earth is telling us is that being a single-cell organism without a brain and ner- a nervous system might be a good thing because they've been around for billions of years. Oh yeah, Brains and nervous systems have been around for a lot, lot uh, less time. Uh-huh. And so, yeah, definitely not, not required. Excellent. Oh. Good. Good news. Yeah, good news. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they got like microbes, there. though, right? Right. Yeah. right. <laughs> I know. Don't dismiss those microbes. They might know. be the they're, ones they're able important. to survive out they're there. Important. Right. I just want to talk about. first actually U.S. vehicles to land on the surface there. Wow. Uh, and it was about 40 odd years ago in the 1970s. Uh, and they were these largest structures that landed there and they took pictures of the surface uh, and they tried to collect soil samples and did some really interesting biological experiments there. Um, I, mean, I think we have a photo of the Viking lander. Can yeah, we, yeah, we, we do. Let's that? get a look at that. The Viking lander. There yeah. it is. Yeah, so you can see the, the lander and uh, there's a human in there to give you a, a sense of scale. And what he's holding up is the arm that extended out of the Viking lander and scooped up the soil that was then brought back into the into the vehicle to be experimented on. Oh. Yeah. I think we have another photo too, maybe, of the of it on Mars. 
Wow. Yeah, because Viking took the first images on the surface of Mars, yeah. right? Yeah, very exciting. It's yeah. not this one, but things like this. And look how red it is. Yeah, the that red must have planet. been spectacular to see in nineteen seventies. Mm -hmm. So that's the arm that was collecting soil. Yes, yeah, it's grabbing the soil out in the scene there. Okay, and then what did it do with that? That was part of an experiment. That was part of a very cool experiment. The first experiment to search for life on another planet. That's no crazy. more and no less. No more. Mm -hmm. Viking did a lot of cool stuff. It took a lot of pictures. It showed us. Mars up close for the first time, but the biological experiment is what really made the mission truly exciting. Oh. Uh, and uh, there were three biological experiments. One of them is particularly interesting. It was called the labeled release experiment. Labeled Lab release, yeah. sorry. Labeled release experiment. That was an experiment uh, that the, uh, the idea for the experiment was that the, the arm with the scoop would collect some, would scoop some dirt from the ground and put it in a container and then add a solution which was called a chicken soup. A chicken soup. <laughs> chicken soup solution. This is chicken soup. And this is chicken soup. Wow. And this is uh, an example of one of the vials that was made in 1974. It has a date uh, on it. It has a date on it. Yeah, yeah. 1974, June. July. July, July 3rd, 3rd, 1974. Wow. Yeah, look at that. Uh, and this is uh, vintage chicken soup from 1974. <laughs> Why is that chicken soup? Uh, there's, there's no rice, there are no there's carrots. There's no rice, no carrots, no potatoes. It's perfectly clear. It's chicken soup for microbes. For microbes, all right. <laughs> and so the idea is that, uh, think about it, if you, are, if you are in a cold, if you have a cold or you're cold and you're starving and you're dehydrated and you're miserable at home, yeah. what would, what's the best thing you can have? A warm cup of chicken, chicken soup. Chicken soup. <laughs> and so yeah, the thinking sucks. at the time was that uh, microorganisms on Mars, if they were present in the soil, they would be dehydrated, no water, very cold, cold uh, very low temperatures. Mm -hmm. And so to, to help them come back alive and actually be able to detect them, we would add this chicken soup uh -huh. so the microbes would have something to feed on, yeah. grow, and then we would be able to measure the uh, gases that are produced as they eat oh. the chicken soup. So that's what the experiment did? That's what the experiment did. Uh, add the uh, chicken soup to the soil and then sniff the gases that would come out of the microbes chewing on the molecules like sugars and amino acids, all the yummy stuff that microbes like to eat and was added with the chicken soup. All right. So wow. you're looking at traces of them digesting, digesting. if you will. Yeah. So uh, in our first evidence of life on another planet could have been microbial poop. Microbial <laughs> poop. Fantastic. <laughs> Why not? Nice. Something all life does. Yeah. Well, yeah. yes, I guess <laughs> that's fair to say. It, it is, yeah. And so, well, yeah, what, what happened? Don't let us hang in here. Uh, yeah, it was really interesting, and it was very inconclusive. Oh. Um, <laughs> so the observation, it was a very interesting observation. When, when the chicken soup was added to the soil, there was a chemical reaction almost immediately, hmm. and gases were released. And the same types of gases that you would expect microbes to produce okay. if they were present. That was interesting oh. and exciting. Yeah. The problem was that the, the rate at which those gases were released was odd was mm -hmm. way too fast, almost instantaneous. Oh, okay. If you expected microbes to be present, you should, they should take their time to come, out, come back up alive and eat their things and then eventually release those gases. So yeah. that was odd. The other odd thing is that part of the experiment was to scoop out another sample of soil and heat it up to very high temperatures to kill everything that might have been living there and then add the chicken soup. Mm -hmm. If the reaction, original reaction was due to biology, we shouldn't see a reaction in the second case. Right, because you would have killed. Every, everybody was dead. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. And what happened was quite the opposite. They added the chicken soup to the dead sample and there was a reaction similar to the first one, suggesting okay. that whatever was causing the reaction was not a microbe. Shoot. Mm. Yes. Mm. Mm. That must have been crazy. You sent your, your experiment on a rover to Mars and it gets there and it does its thing and you're not sure. And you're not sure. I mean, <laughs> you know, you, you never know. Maybe they didn't like the soup. Yeah, well, maybe uh, that's it. They no, like but, tomato soup, you but, know? But definitely the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the experiment was very interesting, very inclusive. In right, sense. right. So then uh, what? Well, uh, it, it was clear from Viking that uh, maybe our thinking about searching for life at that time was a bit naive because mm -hmm. we really didn't know much about Mars until Viking went to Mars. Now, okay. hindsight is always twenty twenty. Sure. So with what we know now, we might think it was naive. At the time, it was probably a very smart thing to do. Yeah. Well, we hadn't been there yet. We so. hadn't been there yet. So, but what, uh, what followed up after Viking was a realization that when next time we search for life, we might want to know in advance a bit more about the planet what conditions are there, and what the history of the planet was. And so a lot of the follow-up missions try to bridge that gap, that knowledge gap, understand uh, what happened to Mars over the course of, his, of its history, how it became the extremely dry, yeah. extremely cold planet that it is today, uh, and maybe try to understand if life was present at some point, whether it could still be there, maybe in other places, or mm -hmm. maybe the chances of life surviving 
throughout Mars's history were pretty much zero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How'd you go from oceans to desert? To deserts, right. exactly. And how does life react to that? Yeah. <laughs> So we've had a lot of robotic missions to Mars since then, right, Michael? What, what's, what, have, we, what have we done over there? Well, we, we've sent a lot of rovers uh, to the surface now. Um, and the latest one now is Curiosity. Uh, and that's uh, going and actually collecting samples and driving around. It has a bunch of uh, instruments. It has a drill on board uh, for collecting samples. Mm -hmm. It has a laser for zapping rocks. So I think it can... we, have a, we have a video of that or some, some, an image. Mm. Right? The, yeah, yeah. There we go. Here's oh, Curiosity. There yeah. 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 And the thing that personally excites me is that uh, Curiosity has the ability to choose what it zaps with its laser, <laughs> uh, which is which is pretty pretty neat. That's exciting. So it's, it's, it's roaming robots, around, yep, just, zapping stuff with yeah, a laser. Yeah. Robots and <laughs> lasers. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. That's cool. And that's very cool for you, the roboticist who exactly, works yeah. on yeah. teaching yeah. robots. Yeah, they're students. getting progressively smarter and yeah. progressively more capable of, of acting with a little bit less oversight from us yeah. here at Earth. Yeah, awesome. Cool. There's some questions. What do we, what do we find out from these rovers, on, uh, from Curiosity or We've some of these rovers? Many, many things, but maybe the one that is interesting to the, uh, to the question of life on Mars is uh, it, it provided the first clear evidence that there were environments on Mars three, three and a half billion years ago that could have sustained life as we know it. Uh -huh. Microorganisms on Earth would have been happy really? in those environments. That, wow. in that case, is a, is, the, is a lake environment, yeah. which had plenty of water, it was long-lived, and the chemistry of that lake was completely compatible with life yeah. as we know it. It was so similar. It was very similar. Wow. And so the conditions were there for life to, to, to exist and to thrive. Cool. Uh, and that's that's a major discovery. Yeah. So that's big news. Yeah. So, so water is kind of the key to all this, it Water seems, is the right? key, and, right. and the progression of those missions is being precisely follow the water. Follow, follow the, the water, water because right. we need it's important for life, and through following the water we've reached these environments on the surface that uh, that it's clear that they could have sustained life in the past. Yeah, yeah. How did we first find water? That was one of the robotic missions, wasn't it? Yeah, well, uh, actual water would be the, the Phoenix mission, right? That's um, right, yeah. Which was a, another stationary lander like the Viking that had an arm that could scoop up uh, soil and collect samples. Yeah. Okay, um, we, we yeah. have a photo of that as well, an image of the Phoenix lander that oh, you can nice. just yeah. Oh, yeah, is yeah. that the arm that's Ooh. scooping? Yep. Yep. Yeah, so that can reach out and collect soil samples. Yeah, like, like Viking was a lander, it didn't move. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, we, in, in, in reality, we had an idea that there might have been, there, there were, that there's water on Mars based on orbital data, uh, but Phoenix truly, truly uh, confirmed those, uh, obser those observations okay. from orbit. And it confirmed it by digging a trench in the soil and exposing oh. uh, ice, water ice, oh, yeah, yeah, and yeah. then analyzing some of that ice. And it was at the poles, right? Yeah. It was near the North Pole. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, based on what we know from orbit, it's uh, as you get closer to the poles of Mars, either the, in the North or the South Pole, mm -hmm. ground ice becomes more and more abundant and close mm -hmm. to the surface. And oh, in okay. fact, the Phoenix site was just a few inches uh, under the uh, a cover of dry soil. Okay, yeah. very cool. Okay, so water ice, it has found, Phoenix. Yeah. And you told me it made another big discovery. It, yeah, it, so, so when uh, uh, Phoenix analyzed the uh, ice, it actually tasted the ice. The first time we taste ice from mm. another planet. How did it taste? It tasted salty. Salty. And that was interesting. Not very salty, but it did have some salt. I see. And the salt turned out to be another very interesting discovery from Phoenix. Oh. Uh, it, uh, one of the major salt components in the soil is called perchlorate. It's a molecule that nobody really cared much about except yeah. in the rocket fuel industry because it's actually rocket fuel. Really? Okay. Uh, but once it was discovered on Mars at significant abundances, everybody became very interested. Yeah. Why is it there? This rocket fuel substance all Ex perchlorate. Exactly. Why is it Mars covered in rocket fuel? All right. Uh, <laughs> Fair and question. so it turns out it's a natural compound. It's found on Earth as well, in oh. deserts and whatnot. Uh, and it's a compound that some, some microbes on Earth can actually eat and oh, use really? as an energy source. Yeah. So that became a very interesting astrobiology uh, result. Uh, an energy source for life sitting there on the surface, very close to water ice. Wow. Uh, but the other yeah. interesting thing about perchlorate is that uh, it's a very reactive compound. It's not reactive at room temperature. You can have perchlorate here on the table and it's not going to happen, and nothing's going to happen to it over millions of years. Oh, really? But if you expose it to radiation, as on Mars, the high radiation that we get, UV, it decomposes into very reactive molecules. Oh, 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 like the sun breaks it down on the exactly. surface? The okay. UV radiation breaks it down and makes uh, reactive compounds just like bleach, for example, the stuff oh, we wow. use at home. Okay. And you know what happens when you mix bleach with chicken soup? <laughs> no. <laughs> what happens is that you get gas released <laughs> ah. and you get very similar gases as they were released 
in the Viking experiments ah, 40 years ago. Mystery solved. Oh and it happens at a similar rate and as similar abundances as Viking observed. So 40 years oh. after Viking, uh, indirectly, without yeah. not uh, actually looking for it, right. Phoenix found the culprit for oh the Viking, gosh. or the most likely cul culprit right. for the Viking biological experiment results. Finally an answer. Yep. That's crazy for the people who worked on it. I hope they were still... Case closed. Yeah, That's yeah, it was very exciting, I'm sure, for people who were uh, waiting 40 years to right. understand what mystery. happened with the ah, mission. Yeah, yeah. Exciting. Okay, fascinating. Oh. We've got a bunch of questions coming in. Shall we turn to... Uh, a question session. We're going to ask yeah. you a whole bunch, as many as we can in five minutes, and we'll look for rapid responses so we can hit a lot of these. Um, so many to choose from. Mon Masta asks, is it possible that we might find fossilized microbial life? That's one of the issues with uh, microbial life, is that they don't leave behind good fossils. Mm. Not certainly dinosaur bones that we can excavate and see. Right. Uh, and so that's, that's a big challenge. Uh, how to find evidence of life uh, coming out of microbes that they're soft-bodied, tiny and unicellular organisms yeah. that when they die, they decompose and don't leave behind. We have some ideas. In fact, uh, when you look at the fossil record on Earth, the oldest evidence of life on Earth, which is dated at 3.5, 3.8 billion years ago, it's actually structures made by microbes, rock structures mm -hmm. made by microbes. The microbes are long gone. Okay. They just leave, yeah. they left the house behind. And what we see now is the house, so wow, to speak. Wow, okay. And nice. so microbes can live behind fossils, but it's, it's, they're hard to find. How neat. Mm -hmm. That is cool. Um, I had a question about what, what methods can you use besides metabolic investigations in these robotic missions? And I think that, that might be an uh, example. There are a number. Uh, you could think of, well, if you go to a place where you think microbes might actually be alive and, and happy, you could bring a microscope. Uh-huh. Bring a sample, put it in water, look at the microscope, and if not, something swims, it's like a microbe yeah. waving at you. <laughs> Another yeah. one could be uh, using instruments that actually uh, analyze chemistry in a lot of detail, organic chemistry, which is what we think life is going to be made of, organic compounds. Mm -hmm. And we can search for patterns in that chemistry that are too complex for uh, something non-biological to produce. Oh, uh, yeah. Biology makes very complex organic compounds, things like DNA and proteins. Oh, yeah. And so if we find okay. something like these, we'll be like finding a skyscraper on the moon. It's like, <laughs> you know, somebody okay. must have built it. Somebody built that. Yeah, 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 yeah I see. Okay. Well, that was a question from Jets115. That was a good one. Andy H87 has one for you, I think, Michael. Mm -hmm. What Would a rover mission to the poles be viable or particularly interesting? I think it would definitely be interesting, and I think actually operating in an icy environment, uh, unlike where the rovers have been driving, would be a lot more interesting, and, or sorry, a, lot, a big challenge, and also interesting. But then there's also the worry about um, planetary protection, right? Because mm -hmm. if we don't want to bring things there, and if there's ice there, we could conceivably make water, and if we make water and we have microbes on the rover, then there's the risk that we could bring our own microbes there and, and, and pollute the, the planet. Something else to worry about yeah. on top of everything else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Here's a related question from Trablador. How long would it take to be certain there is no life and so so we wouldn't have to sterilize everything we send? Could you ever be certain? You can never be certain. I don't know you could be ever be certain because mm -hmm. uh, we're used to the Earth as a planet where it's covered in biology. Uh, but when sometimes when you go to some places on the earth that are extreme, life is not everywhere. It's hiding in very specific places. Yeah, yeah. And if you can imagine a planet that is extreme like Mars, maybe life is sitting somewhere in a very tiny place, maybe kilometers deep. Oh, right. Oh, wow. Okay. So how can, be sure, can, how can you be sure of uh, that it's not there? So yeah. we always need to proceed with caution, I think. Yeah. 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 Good Smilebringer asks, um, what about non-carbon-based life forms? Yeah. We usually base life... Uh, upon life on Earth. There, yeah, there are good reasons why we are made the way we are. And, uh, and there are some of them are reasons that are hard to, uh, you, there's, you, there's only so much you can bend the flaws of physics and chemistry to make things work. And there are ideas about non-carbon based life. Uh, but there are so far no places in, in the universe that we know of where non-carbon non -carbon based life could exist. Uh, they might be there, we haven't found them. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, to start searching, uh, it's probably a, a, a good idea to search for first things that you're familiar with that you can recognize and you know where to search for, rather than search for things that are so different that we, again, might not be able to recognize it even if it's standing in front of us. 
I wonder if that's yeah. related yeah. to this question. So let me throw this out from Death Shaft 20119. Why follow water? We don't know for sure that organisms live only through water, right? Yeah, it's a good point. Uh, but it goes back to what we were talking about. Uh, Mars had water. Uh, other places in the solar system had water. We know what life in water looks like mm -hmm. or is made of, mm -hmm. thanks to uh, Earth biology. So why not go there? It's a familiar place. Right. Uh, if we find it there, one of the interesting reasons why we search for life is because once we find life 2.0, mm -hmm. even if it's water-based and carbon-based but very different from us, then our ideas of life will change, will expand, and then maybe we can think more seriously about life that is completely different yeah, from yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I think we need life 2.0 before we can make that yeah. big mm -hmm. step. That's so exciting. I remember maybe a year ago, the three of us had a conversation and you were telling us that even if you found one dead microbe on Mars, we don't discriminate. <laughs> you would be completely satisfied. That's and right. Super excited That's about right. that. Uh, dead microbes, living microbes. And in fact, if we find a living microbe, we have to kill it in order to understand it, unfortunately. Uh, but, but, but yeah, we, that, even a dead microbe, even a fossilized dead microbe, yeah. half decomposed, right. would tell us, would revolutionize our idea of life, biology, and everything. So, so exciting. very exciting. Wow. So exciting. Yeah. All, it, all it takes is one. Just takes one. That's right. Yeah. Zolidair asks, uh, how do you program a robot to search for life? What sort of decisions do you have to make in order to search the most likely locations? Well. The first thing is you have to identify what the most likely locations are. And the way you do that is actually talking to people like Alfonso, <laughs> and they'll say, go here, go here, this is cool, we should look at that. Um, then when it comes to programming the robot, there's, there's a lot involved from just basic things like getting the robot to physically move in the environment, uh, and then making smarter decisions. And that's really, again, about taking uh, sensor data and then trying to say, you know, yes, this is something valuable. And traditionally, we've, again, consulted with scientists and try to say, you know, well, things that look like this, is good, things like that look different, we ignore. Um, it's a very involved uh, process. It takes a village. Yeah, it does. <laughs> or, or two. Yeah. yeah. Nice. A village or yeah. two. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nice. It's always exciting to see the scientists and engineers really working their magic together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's exciting. Yeah. I like these yeah. projects. Yeah. Well, here, here's an easy one from JB the Dev. How do you boil down, is it life, to a quantitative value? Oh, yeah, easy. Oh, easy. <laughs> easy. Okay. I'll let Michael take this one. Yeah, uh, so basically, um, right now, we can't say, you know, if this, then life. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and perhaps the best way to do it is to try and extract the judgment of the scientists by studying how they behave. And so uh, machine learning techniques are kind of a, a promising approach for that. So eventually, you know, I'll just sit and watch Alfonso long enough, and I'll, I'll write down everything he does, and I'll run it through a, a small Python script, and, and then, right. yeah, I'll ship that out into space. That's and, right. Yeah. Yeah, that, that is it. Uh, uh, my, uh, my job is done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. It's not that simple. I mean, it's a yeah. very involved process. It is. And, yeah. and, 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 and if you think of the, the, of the M members are easy. Something waving at you, yes. yes. Yeah. And something like a meteorite, that there's nothing in there, easy. The, the problems are the, all the gray in-betweens. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. difficult uh, yeah. part. That's, yeah. yeah. But that's also what drives you guys, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's, that's the passion, yeah. yeah. And I guess something else to say is that it's, it's also, it's not one thing. It's mm -hmm. an accumulation of evidence yeah. Oh, yeah. and different observations that we eventually uh, collect to build confidence that we've seen something that might be life. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, good mm -hmm. point. It's, it's not going to be... just looking for one, one silver bullet. No. So it's going to no, be... Yeah. science, rarely you get a silver bullet. Yeah. You get a lot of smoking guns, a lot of smoke and no guns. Some <laughs> guns without smoke, but no silver bullets. <laughs> Yeah. You're too demanding, Alfonso. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for a couple more before we yeah. move on. Um, do you have one lined up? Or I got one. Uh, Go G Nintendo asks, what amino acids, if any, have been detected on Mars? Not none so far. And so yeah, far. isn't okay. that good? Isn't that good a, a good place to start? We've found amino acids mm -hmm. in in uh, other planetary bodies, small bodies, uh, and asteroids and comets, but. Sorry, th those are interesting because they are building blocks for proteins, right? They're interesting for two reasons. One is because life on Earth universally uses them to build proteins, which uh -huh. are very important molecules. The other one is because they are, nature provides them for free. Mm. Amino acids mm. are in, present in meteorites. They can form abiotically without the presence of life. And so you would expect them to be available for life to emerge pretty much in any environment, as long uh, as the environment, they can survive that environment. Okay. And so they are what we call prebiotically, before life, 
available. Oh, nice. And so uh, it's a good it's a good place to start searching for for evidence yeah, of so life. There are common ingredients. There are so common if, ingredients. If everything else lines up for life to emerge, yeah. you've yeah. got your amino acids. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All right. But we haven't so, found any on Mars yet. All right. Keep looking. There's another one yeah. from MDM PhD, Doctor Furlong. What excites you about the future of robotics on other worlds? What robot would you send to space? Um, I'm prepared to send any and all robots to space. <laughs> <laughs> An army. <laughs> yeah. Robot army. Well, exactly, right? And so, so um, one of the things that humans like doing when they're exploring is breathing oxygen and eating uh, and, and coming back. Um, whereas <laughs> robots are less demanding on that front. And so if we're going to really explore farther away things and things that are much, uh, environments that are much more hazardous, uh, robots are, are in <clears throat> my biased friends. opinion, the, the thing to do, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I think planets, uh, well, the moon is still, there's a lot to learn there. Mars is great. Uh, Europa um, is, is another possibly exciting location. Moon of Jupiter, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah and that actually has the potential to have, uh, it's an icy world and might yeah. have water on it as well. So. Yeah. Grad students are a good alternative to robots. They're not very demanding, so <laughs> oh. grad students. <laughs> Send one of those to Europa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, been there, so. <laughs> yes, yes, you know what it's like. We need the grad students to make the robots work. That's true, that's true. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a call to everyone who wants to get yeah. involved. These guys need grad students. Um, so there's a comment that will lead us on to the next topic I want to talk about. Um, I want to hear about some of the, the new tools that you guys are developing and kind of where you want to look and how that determines how you're going to look. So this comment was from Hobbes555. I guess if there is life on Mars, it's deep underground? Is that how it's you guys see it, too? It's a good guess. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, Does that drive what you're working on? Yep, in, in indeed. The uh, if anything, we've learned about Mars is that the surface is extreme, but maybe as you get deeper and deeper, conditions become better and better. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, then there are good reasons for it. As you get closer to the center of the planet, temperatures go up, and we yes. know there's plenty of ice buried down the ground. So at some point, theoretically, that ice should melt. Ah, yes. Create mm. a, maybe a habitable environment. Yeah. yeah. Uh, as you go deeper, also. Some of the nasty things you get on the surface, you don't get at depth, like radiation. Mm -hmm. And so it's the, the, uh, as you go deeper, you're more protected from these things. So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a good bet if you go deeper. Okay. It's also harder. Yes, ah. yes. Getting so is that um, something you're working on, like how to go deeper? We are. Yes, yes. We well, we <laughs> ask, and then uh, now the okay. ball is on their on their court to uh, to come up with ways to do it. I see. So yeah. you, you roll yeah. up at Michael's office. Yes, I said, Mar uh, Michael, get me two dig. kilometers, and <laughs> then, <laughs> two then I'll come back ten years later. I'm going to need a lot more grass. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So so we're actually uh, we're we're developing a smart drill right now. Uh -huh. Smart uh, drill. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and and so we want a smart drill because again. What does that mean? Well, it's a drill that. Uh, deals with the problems it encounters so we don't have to. Okay. And so all these robots, they're, they're far away. It takes, you know, on Mars, it takes about 20 minutes to get signal back, right? Okay. So you can have encountered a problem before we even, the drill can have encountered a problem before we even know that it's, it's going on. Okay. Uh, and it could be too late at that juncture if it just keeps trying to just, just drill as if everything was normal. So the smart drill tries to recognize problems uh, and then fix them by, uh, well, Basically, by trying to feel how it's how it's it's behaving. So, if you're drilling at home, yep. uh, you know you're you're putting a, a screw into a piece of wood. Uh, if something goes wrong, you can feel the drill shakes, or it hits a knot and it just starts skipping, or you thread the, the screw, or sorry, you strip uh, the head of the mm -hmm. screw. You know, you feel that it's not right. Yeah. Um, similar, we can do similar things with our drill. We can look at vibrations. We can look at how much power it's drawing to do the drilling. Uh, we can look at the temperature, how hot it's getting. Uh, and we can use that to then try and decide, okay, this is a particular kind of fault. And there's several different kinds of, of things that can go wrong with drilling. And then we take pr particular actions to, to fix those problems. And so it can be things like there's a rock between the drill and the hole that it's drilling, and it just sort of binds up. Uh, or there can be soil falling in, and it, it can't clear the hole fast enough, so it's yeah. it's uh, not making progress. Uh, so yes, we we instrument the drill, put lots of sensors on it, look at what data is coming back, and say, okay, this is a binding fault. This this is uh, you know this is we've hit a hard surface we can't penetrate. Um, here, take the appropriate action. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the drill itself can actually figure that out on its own now? Is that what your goal that's, is? That's, that's the idea, yeah. Okay. We've been teaching it to be a, a smarter drill. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The problem is that yeah. Skype 
Skype calls between Mars and Earth are really, really bad. <laughs> uh, it takes about 20 minutes to uh, get a hello back. Wow. And so we cannot rely on, on instruments there. Exactly. And especially if we're drilling into like icy surfaces, right? We could conceivably melt the walls and again, creating water, which is a planetary protection problem. Mm -hmm. But it could also possibly refreeze and oh, get yeah. the drill stuck oh, in the right. ice indefinitely. And that would be the end of the mission. Yeah, and we can, oh, and, yeah. Yeah, we can, that drill cannot wait for us to learn about it, mm -hmm. decide what to do next, send the information. By then, it might be too late. Right. I can imagine right, right. trying to have a conversation with you, and 20 minutes later, right. I get a response back. Imagine that. Hello, right. Abby. Right, right. And if you're asking for instructions, or, you know, yeah. Abby, I messed up. And My drill might, is stuck. What do I do? And you might only it's get two chances in the day to okay. say something, oh. which is yeah. actually yeah, the case crazy. on Mars. So, well, that yeah. really underscores the need for some kind of autonomy here. Like, right. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's got it's to act robots. on its own yeah. a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Diagnose its own symptoms, right? And Precisely. So you've said it can back, back itself out, mm -hmm. or it can hammer through a hard yeah, thing, Yeah, so right? the drill we're developing is a rotary percussive drill. And so that means it can drill in like a normal drill, or it can start hammering uh, to break up whatever it's drilling through to make it easier to make further progress with the more standard okay. drilling approach. Cool, man. Yeah. Oh, wow. Sounds good. I'll take so one. So we have sent drills to Mars before, though, right? Can you tell us a little bit about? Yeah, so Curiosity these? actually mm -hmm. has, a, has a drill. It's, it's, um, it's similar. It's a rotary percussive mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have here, this, um, this is just a drill that I took from our machine shop. So this is not to scale. It's not an accurate representation of what MSL has, uh, Curiosity. Yeah. Uh, so Curiosity's drill is a little bit fatter, uh, right. and it's about gets about a five centimeter depth, so something about this okay. this length. We actually have video of it drilling yes. that we could watch right now on Mars. Curiosity is going to put down its well, drill. That's the arm with the drill, yeah. Yeah. And, and this whole drilling process takes about twenty five minutes. Okay. Right. And again, it takes twenty minutes wow. for the start of the drilling to get back to Earth. Right. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's almost done by the time we'd find out it's begun. Oh, okay. So if something goes wrong. At the start, yeah. you're way too late. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, in, on, it's on sped up right now. The, yes. Yeah, right? And it's also on a loop, right? Yeah. So yeah. we're seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. That's a slow process, though. I see yeah. it's, it's not like my... It's meticulous. It's meticulous, meticulous. yes. That's Pardon right me, word. curiosity. <laughs> 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 okay, so it's drilling into Martian rocks. Mm -hmm. um, we have photos also of holes that it's drilled, which is kind of fun because... It's on another planet, and it looks just like a drill hole at home. Can we see the image of a hole drilled by Curiosity? Yeah, look at that. Oh, wow. yeah. So, so the big hole is, is the drill hole. And then yeah. that uh, gray material is the stuff that was cleared out of the hole as was making progress. And then there's that row of little holes. That's where the laser zapped it to sort of vaporize oh, what's there yeah. and see what the rock is made of. So I have a question. Um, Why is it gray? Why is that powder oh, gray? Uh, We're so, out of paint. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Mars is known as the red planet, but it's really, it's covered in, in rust, oxidized materials. Uh -huh. That's why it's red. Okay. Um, but it's not red all the way through. What? And that gives you a good idea of why it's important to go deep, is because it's, it's the depth dimension is another world. Yeah. Uh, we oh, would have yeah. never learned that if we hadn't yeah, gone. Yeah. Imagine what we can do if we go even deeper. Right. We might learn things right, that right. were completely unexpected. That was unexpected. So that curiosity taught us that it's it's not really a red planet. Not oh. not inside. <laughs> not in, not in its heart. Not in its oh. heart. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Not inside. Oh. I That's had right. no idea before I saw that photo. It's pretty cool. I seriously didn't know. And and it might be red in other places. Yeah. So uh, if anything we've learned about Mars is that it's it's very different. Oh, it's yeah. not the uniform planet once we thought it was. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which is why the rover robots are so important, right? Yep. We, we can't just characterize one, one little spot. region. Oh, yeah, That's right. right, right. We need to move yeah. around. Maybe you land in the one spot that is gray right. underneath. Yeah, the yeah I mean, imagine if we were like, you. you know, uh, 10 feet over from where life was. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> <Imagine>. <laughs> so we've, we've looked at the, the Curiosity drill. You've shown us mm -hmm. how big that is. Yeah. What are you working on now? Oh, yes. Uh, this is the drill that we're working on. <laughs> Slightly oh. bigger. It's a little bigger. It's yeah. A little bit bigger, yeah. <laughs> so what you see here is uh, these ridges here, it's the, the flutes, and this is what lifts the material out of the hole. Okay. Right? And so we drill this. It's about, about three feet long. And then what we really care about is this last 10 centimeter bite here at the, at the bottom. And that's, you'll notice that the flutes are much more tightly spaced. That's yeah. flutes. Yes, yeah, the ridges, the, yeah. the ramp, right? Because this is, this is, you know, it's a ramp. It pushes things up mm -hmm. and goes out the, the top of the hole. Right. Um, so again, they're denser here because we don't want the material to move by too quickly once we've hit the, the depth we care about. Uh, and then we pull this out of the hole up to a sample collection uh, device, which then takes the soil to the instruments. Gotcha. For analysis. Yep. Then, yeah. 
And then we look to see. And then we look for things like microbes or yeah. compound, organic compounds mm. and things like this. So what is this hole here? I'm looking down a oh. hole right there. Yeah, so there's a hole in the bottom, and that's for uh, cables to go down. Because, again, this is a smart drill, and smart means sensors. And okay. so we have at the... In this drill, we'll have a temperature sensor to see how hot it's getting, because that tells you like how hard is it to drill into to what you're drilling to. Mm -hmm. And then it also has a conductivity sensor. And that that'll mean, yeah. What does conductivity mean? That'll help us detect if we hit uh, water or, or ice yeah, or in the hole, or if we're making liquid water. Yeah. If there's liquid water, it's going to send a signal. If it's yeah. dry, no signal. So yeah. why is that data useful? What does that tell you? Well, it tells them, or it tells the drill. Uh, how to operate, when to stop, when to proceed. If it gets very hot, you might want to stop and let, let it cool down. One reason might be planetary protection. We don't want to create an environment, if we're drilling in things like ice, for example, we don't want to create an environment where microbes, especially microbes we bring with us, mm -hmm. might grow, planetary protection. Mm -hmm. uh, but we also can learn about what, what's the consistency and the, and the strength of the materials we're drilling into. So it's information that is good for the science, but it's information that is good for the health of the drill. Yeah. All right. So this you would attach onto a rover or a lander. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. When, so. Whatever vehicle is taking the drill to the places we want to drill in. And that's, that's something you test yes, on Earth, right? You do. Yeah. Right. So and, right and now, I believe. If, yeah, in fact. Yes. <laughs> in fact, right now. As we speak. Right now. Right now. <laughs> right now. Right now? Um, yep. Yeah, we've got a team of scientists down in the Atacama Desert in Chile, and they're testing a of this drill. Uh, with uh, in an actual simulated environment. This uh, minute, they should be drilling a hole. <laughs> this very yep. minute. Yep. If they're not, if they're not, Alfonso yes. is going to be. <laughs> set. We, we got we some video. Some footage. Yeah, some yeah, great footage from, we brought. We got the, sent back to us here yeah, at yeah. Ames from the Atacama. Yes. Yeah. So this is the drill site, and that's so from a few days ago, I think. Yeah. Yeah, and that's oh. where. Uh, the scientists are set up in the, and that's our workhorse robot, K-Rex 2, mounted with the K-Rex. Yeah, K-Rex 2. It's our intro <laughs> okay. rover, rover, yeah. And there you can see the drill, and the blue structure is the arm that we use to collect sample and deliver to the instruments. Nice. Um, and it's digging. It, yeah, uh, you in, see the drill turning. Yeah, and yeah. that gear right there is where the sample uh, comes out of the drill as it, when it pulls back up, and the bucket is the cup. And here is one of our researchers uh, just observing and taking notes on the experiment as it's running. Look at that landscape. Mm -hmm. that, Mars. that looks a lot like the Viking picture we saw a little <laughs> while ago from the surface of Mars. It's, it's truly it's really Martian. Mars on Earth. Yep. Yeah. So cool. What is it? Yeah. Tell us a little bit more what it's like to be there because you guys have been there yourselves, right? Yeah. 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 So that's the reason the drill is there uh, and, and the rover and the scientist. This is part of a project called ERITS. It's okay. uh, the Atacama Rover Astrobiology Drilling Studies. Yes. A mouthful. <laughs> quite a mouthful. Uh, and, uh, and the goal of the uh, rover of, of the project is to, to precisely learn Mars science on Earth so go to the driest place on the planet. That's the Atacama Desert in northern Chile. It's the driest place on Earth. Uh, uh, it's what we call in, in astrobiology, in, in planetary sciences, an, an analog environment. An analog, okay. Analog that yeah. is similar, not exactly the same, but very similar to places out there on other planets. And so it, it allows us to do science and test engineering without going to those places, before we go to those places. Right, right, right. Getting make ready sure to go work. to those places, Yeah, when right. it comes to, to engineering, make sure that things work properly in environments that are similar to the places we want to go. When it comes to science, it allows us to understand things like what happens if you add chicken soup to soil that is very dry. Mm -hmm. Then when we go to Mars and do the experiment, we can kind of uh, predict what might happen. Right. And so that's what IRIS is doing. It's preparing NASA to search for life on other planets by going to the Atacama Desert and testing this instrumentation. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. I love these projects. But yeah, really as, cool. as dry as the Atacama is, we still find life there. We do. It's, you know, this is yeah. the Earth. Uh, it's hard not to find life. Yeah. And so uh, it's a place where we can test how good or bad our instruments are. Mm -hmm. It's definitely um, a place where if you don't find anything, maybe you don't, write, you don't have the right instrument. Okay. Uh, because we would, expect, we would expect life on Mars if it was present or fossilized life on Mars to be a lot less abundant than even the Atacama Desert. Yeah. It's a lot more. A lot Worst of an environment. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. um, you, you you said uh, Mars is a thousand times yes, drier yes. even so than the Atacama, the, Atacama, the Atacama, the driest yeah, place uh, on Earth. Take right? the Atacama, the driest place on Earth, um, where you've been there. I have. Uh, but, uh, I, yeah. Sunscreen, sunglasses, a I hat, and plenty of water. <laughs> it's yes, dry. it's really really dry. It's so dry that no plants or animals survive. There's the only yeah, forms nothing. of life that survive in the driest parts of the Atacama are microorganisms, and they're not doing very well for that matter. Mm -hmm. And really? so. Oh. 
uh, at pedantic Mars, and uh, everything we know about it, it tells us it's 100 to 1,000 times drier than the Atacama. So the idea is if you can't find it in the Atacama, you, you don't find stand a chance on Mars. On Mars, yeah. yeah. Okay. If you find it in the Atacama, you might still not be able to find it on Mars because it's so much more extreme. But the Atacama gives you that confidence that if you find it there, maybe you're on the good track, on the right track to find it on yeah. Mars. Yeah. So this is kind of like a test test case for Mars it's in a certain test sense. Case. Yeah. 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 I like to call it a dry run <laughs> in the driest <laughs> desert on Earth. No pun intended. <laughs> Very much intended, but it's okay. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Yeah, but fascinating. So yes, I did get to go last year to cover the story. Yep. And there were lots of scientists there yeah, last yeah, year yeah. working in the field. But this year, what's different is a whole bunch of you are, are here. Yes, this that's year, right. right. So this is the fourth year of, pro of the project. It's the fourth time I think that the team goes to the Atacama. Uh, in the previous years, it's been a lot of science in, on the ground. Mm -hmm. and uh, testing different pieces by themselves or integrated into the rover. You're taking soil samples. Soil samples, and analyzing it, so we're yeah. doing a lot of things. But this year is special because what we're doing this year is simulate a Mars mission. Mm -hmm. And so we have boots on the ground with the rover and the drill and the instruments, and then we have a backroom science team here at Ames directing the rover what to do, receiving data from the rover, and based on that data, giving the next steps, instru instructions on what to do next, just the way you would do it on a Mars mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that way so you, we'll would have a, you would have a team of scientists back on Earth. Every morning, 9 a.m. this yeah. week, we meet, we, collect the, we get the data that the rover collected the previous day and the instruments. We analyze that data. It's not process data, it's quick looks that we call, which okay. tell us, yeah, you got the sample, you got the data, looks good, move on. Okay. And based on what we learn, the few snippets we get from that, from those data sets, we decide, well, go there and get that sample or go deeper and get another sample. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a tactical mm -hmm. decision that we need to make on the fly, yeah, pretty much. You, guys, you call it dirt to data, right? Dirt to data, that, yes. All that's happening on the rover. Thanks to uh, intelligent rovers that we, uh -huh. we can tell them, pick that up, and the next thing we know is the composition. Thanks, Michael. Oh. No problem. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> right, but no, I, I love that term because it, it makes it really clear that the, the rover is drilling. It's pulling up dirt. It's taking the sample, throwing it into the instruments it carries. It's doing all, all those yeah. things. And then the instruments are processing the sample, analyzing yeah. the sample, and sending the data. And humans are not in the loop. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. That's so exciting. Yeah. Airplane Man 1997 says, that's cool. <laughs> he likes <laughs> to drill. we can all agree on that. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Here's a question also about the drill. MGM PhD asks, what material is it made of? Uh, this is steel. Steel. Yeah. Yep. And it's probably something like this that we would send. Yeah. Yes. All right. Um, mm -hmm. Quick, quick. Trap, Trapping Vin asks, <laughs> uh, how much analysis can be done directly on Mars compared to how much can be done by bringing samples back to Earth? So that's a good question. There, there are two different levels of analysis. You might want to do a preliminary, very quick analysis to check the health of the instruments mm -hmm. or to, to, to make sure that you got data, yes, no. Uh, and that has very little science involved. But then that data gets transferred, sent to us, uh, and then we have all the time in the world to look at it carefully uh, and analyze the details. Obviously, uh, we might want to make decisions quickly for the next steps for the mission, but all the data gets uh, 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 saved in the repository that scientists pretty much around the world can access and analyze and look and, and, and tease out uh, over many years. So we, we're still looking at Viking data. Oh, wow. And wow. so, you know, uh, that's, it's, that science can move. It, it moves a very hectic uh, pace at the beginning of the mission, mm -hmm. but then we have all the time in the world to actually dig through the data and understand what's going on. We do have a mission where they're, they're looking at caching samples, right? For that's back, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah, the next yeah. one, Mars 2020. Yeah. Okay. And that's sort of the, the follow-on from Curiosity, and it's going to it's going to a lake bed, right? It's going to another lake. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what we think was a lake, based mm -hmm. on what we know from orbit. Yeah, yeah. and it's going to be the first step in a uh, campaign for sample return to bring yeah. samples actually back to Earth. Wow. Very exciting. exciting. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Riot asks, any plans in the future to take samples from the areas where we see seasonal brine flow on cliff faces? So that's someone who's been following the, oh. the Mars news. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, so that salty water was found flowing. Right? There, there are, there are in, intriguing observations on the surface of Mars. We're not still, we're still trying to figure out what the, the, the cause for these patterns is. But there is mm. one possibility: there is uh, liquid water, or oh, salty water. Yes. And so that that would be like, a, you know, for astrobiologists, that would be a beacon. Uh, go, come here and, and take me, <laughs> uh, sample me. 
Um, but the uh, but but it's not easy. Uh, there are many places we would like to go, and and normally the places we want to go are the most challenging ones. They're always on the slope. They're always <laughs> in a difficult environment. So for whatever reason, it's it's never easy. Yeah. Uh, but th this is definitely one. Uh, of many places we would like to go and, and collect samples. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, okay, the challenges of drilling off-world makes me think of plans for the Artemis program. So oh, Na NASA yeah. is heading to the moon we are, yeah. in 2024, and I think that's going to be part of it, isn't it? It is, yeah. And, and the, so, I mean, Artemis is the, the trip back to the moon where we're sending the first woman uh, and then... Uh, more men to the, to the moon, <laughs> presumably, Maybe. at some point. Um, yeah, and, and so if, if that's setting up to be long-term habitation mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the moon. And one of the things we need to do is try and get resources there, right? So uh, we've recently found out uh, that there is water on the moon, which is kind of surprising. There is frozen um, ice crystals, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's hard to extract. It's an icy material, right? Uh. And again, you will want a smart drill to try and be mitigating the, the risks of, of drilling into these icy surfaces. So stuff like we're doing on ARIDS actually feeds yeah. into the, to the Artemis yeah, uh, yeah. mission. I can is, see It's really kind of cool. That is exciting. Yeah. Right. So it's a multi-purpose drill potentially for yeah. many like it. locations off-world. Yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that. You've got you know the scientists working with the engineers for the Mars search for life, and oh, it's also going to be really helpful when we get to the moon. Yep. Yeah, it's an example of how exploration drives exploration drives right. exploration. It's yeah, just, yeah, yeah, yeah. And a, a, a wheel that doesn't stop turning. Yeah. It's pretty cool. So Ooh. cool. I love these things. Here's a, a question I like from Airplane Man 1997. What would the drill sound like on Mars? <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> That's, That's a great a question. The atmosphere is a lot thinner. thinner yeah. 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 So it would certainly be quieter. Or does it, it sound quieter. like in the Atacama? Does it have a sound? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it would yeah. sound. Uh, what, what does it, it sound it like in the Atacama? Like jackhammer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When it's hammering. It's slightly higher pitched jackhammer. Is it really? Yeah. That's what oh, okay. it sounds like okay. when you're sleeping, <laughs> trying to sleep in the tent in the Atacama and the engineers are yeah. testing the drill. That's what you have. Uh, have, have <laughs> also, if it's drilling into something hard, there's a high pitched squeak noise. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. yeah. I remember really, the squeaking yeah, noise. It's definitely not white noise. No. no but no, no, no idea how it would sound on Mars? Quieter, maybe higher pitch? Yeah, or lower. I don't know. Actually, it's a good question. But it would be quite as annoying. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and there wouldn't be anybody there to have to listen to it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Not, not, yet. Yeah. 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 not yet. Yeah. Also, Almost, there is life on Mars. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can true. ask them once we find them. We arrive and we're the worst neighbors yeah, ever the as soon as we get there. And the noise we made. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, also about the Martian environment, uh, Le Jour's Pro asks, is Martian gravity similar to what we have on our planet? No, no, no. Right. It's about a third, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and so, does, uh, does that affect the drill and how you have to design it? That's a good question. So when we're drilling, we apply force. Yeah. Um, and gravity helps. Yeah. It does, and actually, that would, I guess, affect the rate that we could extract material from the hole. Yeah. Um, so to compensate for some of the weight loss yeah. <laughs> that you get on Mars, yeah. yay, if you want to yay. die, uh, <laughs> to compensate for some that, we actually have to add some weight on the drill so that it can push oh, okay. uh, downwards. Oh, with enough force. With enough force yeah, yeah, to yeah. go through layers, yeah. But, so it has an effect. Yeah. All right. More, more questions. Like Regal16 asks, does the drill go straight down? Or does it have the ability to change directions or even go horizontally? Straight down. It's a straight yeah. one yeah. one way. Yes, yeah, at okay. least in the setup that we're doing in, in ARIDS. You could conceivably try and do slant drilling, uh, but that would be a more complicated problem again. And risky. Yeah, because uh, it could, like, you know, go off to one side or something if it, or, if it you know. Or even snap yeah. if you force it too much. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, it's made to go straight down. Straight down, okay. Space TV Internet wants to know if both of our guests, you guys, could be this on the surface of Mars tomorrow, what would be the first thing you would do to search for life? Start digging, uh, bring some chicken soup. <laughs> uh, that's a good question. Well, I, uh, I, I, I have, the, as, as we mentioned earlier, the surface of Mars is very different. Uh, whatever you, the, the oh, day where you go, it's a very different buried environment. Buried all over the surface, yeah. And so if I was at the, at, uh, at some places, like near the polar caps, I would get some of that water ice, mm -hmm. melt it, cup of tea maybe, <laughs> and then put it under the microscope and see if something swims around. Okay. If I was in a place like, like where Curiosity is, uh, ancient rocks may, uh, that formed in the lake bed three billion years ago, I might get some samples and run them through very sensitive instruments that can analyze the chemistry and search for those traces of dead microbes maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, if I could 
bring Michael with me and he could drill two kilometers. <laughs> I would just wait in the surface until we get the sample <laughs> yeah. and, then, uh, and then see what's there if something is actually lurking down there. So it depends yeah. on where you are. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's a, well, certainly was a varied environment. It still is a varied environment from a geological perspective. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so it's it's just like not one place isn't enough if we want to increase our odds of finding life. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I we'll go all over. Yeah, mm. Cuba Meister zero nine asks, how long would it take from discovering to confirming to publishing that life has been found? Hmm. Yeah. Scientific process. The scientific <laughs> process. Yeah. Uh, kind of like what would it whoa. take for you to be sure? Well, like, and I believe. guess it depends on what you find. If you find something waving back at you, don't even publish. <laughs> Just put it up on the web and let everybody enjoy it. Would they uh, believe you? Uh, would they believe you? That's a different yeah. story. Uh, if, if, we, if we find... It's not going to be probably such clear, clear cut. It's not going to mm. be a straight path. It would be surprising. Science rarely works that way, that you have a clear path from discovery to publication to acceptance. Mm -hmm. And especially with things so important and and groundbreaking as finding life on another planet. So mm -hmm. uh, it's going to take a while to process the data. Uh, I, I wish it was clear cut, but uh, if not, then there will be debates. There will be meetings and conferences where people will go and have a back and forth. Mm -hmm. uh, eventually, papers will be published. Uh, and then the scientific method demands that we don't stop there. Mm -hmm. We try again, we continue, and we confirm or disprove those results. Mm -hmm. And it's that process of of uh, building on results and testing and new hypotheses and new, and new experiments, but in the end, either provides the evidence that we need or or not. So, sure. uh, and so, like with Viking, it took about forty years. Yes. So, yeah. for example, and not everybody, <laughs> and, and, and and there might be people out there that were not convinced mm -hmm. uh, of of the perchlorate explanation. Okay. And it's a valid thing in science that you can always doubt. You should always doubt mm -hmm. the uh, the uh, standing explanation. So and keep testing yeah. and, and, and keep testing. testing. Yeah. And yeah. So you, you can't prove things right. You can only prove them wrong. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. Good one. Uh, quick question uh, from Digital Donger: Will Mars 2020 rover have any instruments for life detection? It does, uh, yeah. in, a, in a sense, uh, because 2020 relies a lot on, the so on doing a lot of the science when the samples come back to Earth. Mm -hmm. uh, the focus is on uh, smart instruments that can identify the right samples to bring back. Ah, okay. And so that doesn't require really analyzing every element in that rock to know exactly where it came from. We can do that back mm -hmm. at on Earth when the samples come back. But we do need instruments that can tell, well, you know, between those two samples, this looks, this looks like a better sample to cache mm -hmm. and preserve and okay. bring back to Earth because of its composition, it might be different, and things like this. So those instruments are selected precisely to do that, select the best possible samples for return. Okay, mm -hmm. neat. All right. Sleepy underscore Gary asks, um, were you inspired by any sci-fi to pursue this field? No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> scientist, space scientist, uh, sci-fi. No. Um, I'm a Star Wars fan. You are. Yeah. Okay. I, I robot by, by Asimov. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, in Star Trek, obviously. Yeah, it always obviously. has to start somewhere, right? With yeah. the imagination. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We've had endless debates about what's the best science movie, mm -hmm. sci-fi sci movie, yeah. in the Atacama, Michael and I. Got a lot of time on your hands there. Or, you get, you get, oh, yeah. you get plenty of time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, no, no internet, so. Uh, and no internet. Oh, my God, yeah. <laughs> uh, we don't have a lot of time left, so maybe one more question. Um, mm. From MDM PhD, what have we learned about Martian dust or dirt that would impact robotic tasks? Is that something you're learning from the ARADS project and the Atacama? How does. We're, How we're actually having, deal with the dirt? <laughs> we're actually having an interesting uh, problem in ARADS right now. Uh, in that when we're drilling up dirt, we have a camera that's looking at where the dirt comes out and goes into the scoop, and the dirt is all getting stuck to the lens of the camera, ah. um, which is a problem for cameras because yeah. uh, they, they, they need to be able to see to, to yeah. be useful. Yeah. Um, so that's that kind of um, that mitigation, dust mitigation is, is a big thing. We're that's learning. a problem. Wind yeah. is a problem. Do you remember we have this uh, scoop that is collecting uh, cuttings from the drill and then brings them to the instrument. If you have strong winds, your cuttings might blow mm. out of the scoop. So we mm. learn how to mm. position the scoop and the rover in a way that it blocks the wind uh, and prevents 
uh, sample loss. Oh, okay. Yeah, we learned a lot of things. Nice. All right, keep going, ARADs. We yeah. to know these things before our rovers go to Mars and start drilling. Uh, but that is all the time we have it's for today. It goes so right. quickly. But thank you so much to you guys for yeah, joining us today. This you. has been fascinating. And thank you to everyone who joined us in the chat on Twitch. Uh, join us next time. That'll be October 24th for our second annual NASA-themed Halloween costume and cosplay contest. So that was a lot of fun last year. Join us for that. Thanks for watching, and we will see you next time.